Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How's everyone doing? How's everyone doing? Alhamdulillah. How's your Ramadan going so far and your Qiyamul Layl and your worship and your fasting? Are you finding that Fahmul Quran is making a difference in your understanding of the Quran? Although it's very brief, but it just gives you a faham, a brief understanding of what you're reciting in the Book of Allah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al kareem, amma ba'd. Fa'udhu billahi min al shaytan al rajim. Bismillahi al rahman al rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadari, wa yasir li amri, wa hlu al uqdata min lisani, yafqahu qawli. The best deed is to learn and teach the Qur'an. The Prophet wasallam said, The best among you is the one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it. And this is why we should always be engaged on, in one of two works, either learning the Qur'an or teaching the Qur'an. And those who learn and teach the Qur'an are among the special servants of Allah. They're among the chosen servants of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna lillahi ahlina min nas Allah has his own people among mankind. They said, O Messenger of Allah, who are they? He said, Hum ahlul Qur'an, ahlullahi wa khasatuh. They are the people of the Qur'an, the people of Allah and those who are closest to him. So the people of Qur'an are Allah's special servants, chosen ones, VIPs, very important, very close to him. And why are they called Ahlullah, the people of Allah? This is for honor. This is known as idafa tashrifi, an attribution of honor. Just the way we say Baytullah, the house of Allah, it's attributed to Allah for honor. Kaabatullah, naqatullah. So similarly, Ahlullah. Ahlullah are the Ahlul Quran. And those who learn and teach the Quran, learn, those who learn and teach the Quran actually earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever would be pleased to love Allah and his Messenger, let him read from the Mus'haf. Let him read from the written Qur'an. In another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu said, it is imperative for you to have taqwa, for this is the accumulation of all good. And upon you is jihad in the path of Allah, for it is the monasticism of the Muslims. Finally, upon you is the remembrance of Allah and the recitation of his book, for it is light for you on earth and a means by which you'll be mentioned in the heavens. A light for you on earth and a means by which you'll be mentioned in the heavens. Ibrahim Maqtasi used to advise his student Abbas ibn Abdul Da'im, recite the Quran much and do not abandon it. Then what you seek will become easy. Then what you seek will become easy in proportion to how much Quran you recite. In proportion to your relationship with the Quran, you will attain ease in your objectives. So the more ease you want in your life, the more you want Allah to make matters easy, then the more connection you must establish with the Quran. So we make dua to Allah that he gives us the ability to read the Quran and understand it and implement it in this blessed month of Ramadan. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِسُوء إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي and I do not acquit myself. Indeed, the soul is a persistent enjoiner of evil, except those upon which my Lord has mercy. Indeed, my Lord is forgiving and merciful. Yusuf السلام, says this about himself, that even though I am cleared of blame, I don't claim myself to be pure. At another place in the Quran, it is said, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ So do not claim yourselves to be pure. Every person at some level or the other makes a mistake. And the closer someone is to Allah, the more he fears and the more he sees his faults, the more he sees his mistakes. And it is based on this that he fears his Lord, that I haven't given the haq of Allah's worship. I haven't given the right of Allah's worship. Now Yusuf السلام, was a righteous person. He feared Allah. He was a prophet of Allah, but he doesn't absolve himself. And then 
He attributes evil to the soul. Indeed, the soul is a persistent enjoiner of evil, except those upon which my Lord has mercy. Any person can only save himself from the evil of his soul when the mercy of Allah covers him. Otherwise, his own nafs deceives him, and he ends up committing the evil action, considering it beautiful, considering it good, even though he may regret that action later on. And it is said, that there are three types of souls. There are three types of souls that are mentioned in the Quran. One of them is mentioned here. Indeed, the soul is a persistent enjoiner of evil. And then the second type is the soul that reproaches. And the third type is the content soul. Now you see people are born with desires wants, wishes, and these desires continue to enjoin him to commit evil. Indeed, the soul is a persistent enjoiner of evil, inciting him to evil, inciting him to fulfill his desires. And when a person ends up committing that action, when he ends up doing it, and then he sees the results, he feels regret. When he sees the consequences of that evil, he begins to feel remorse. He begins to blame himself. And this is nafs al the soul that reproaches. And then if he repents, turns back to Allah, and reforms his actions, then he becomes a nafs al And this is what we need to aim for. We should strive to be nafs al and constantly check ourselves. Do we have nafs al do we have nafs al mutma'inna or not? And this nafs is mentioned in Surah Al Fajr, where Allah says, Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya, fadukhuli fi ibadi, wadukhuli jannati. So nafs al mutma'inna is the soul that is pleased with Allah, and Allah is pleased with it. So we should make dua to Allah for this to make our nafs mutma'inna and also strive towards it, work towards it. And if we find any ups and downs in our nafs, if we find our nafs going here or there or getting out of control, then try as much as possible to bring it back to nafs mutma'inna, whether it is by repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking forgiveness, doing istighfar, doing tawbah, and if you have wronged someone else, then by apologizing to that person. وَقَالَ الْمَلِكْ and the king said, Ituni bi, bring him to me. nafsi. I will appoint him exclusively for myself. And when he spoke to him, he said, when the king spoke to Yusuf, السلام, the king said, Indeed, you are today established in position and trusted. Qala, he said, Yusuf السلام, said in response, Appoint me over the storehouses of the land. Indeed, I will be a knowing guardian. The king wanted to keep Yusuf السلام, close to himself. The king wanted to make him a courtier. But Yusuf السلام, preferred to be a worker, doing the real work out there. So since the king had made an offer, Yusuf السلام, accepted the offer, and he presented himself for a work that he could do best, which other people were not ready or prepared to do. He had the qualifications. And that's because Allah made him go through a specific stage in his life in the house of Aziz where he learned such amazing managerial skills that now he was best able to do this task. And what this tells us is that there's no harm in putting forth your strengths before another so that your talents are best used. This is not self-praise. This is not self-projection. So this is something allowed. But we must remember that this is not something allowed absolutely or unconditionally. This is not something permissible unconditionally, but it is permissible in cases of necessity. So for example, you write about yourself in a CV, your buyer data, that's fine. But if you keep verbalizing what's in your CV in every gathering to every person, then that's not fine. That's something that is disliked because that is flattering them, boasting, showing off. So claiming oneself pure is something that is not allowed. But if there is a purpose, a need, 
like you're applying for a job and you mention your qualifications, then that's perfectly okay. And in any case, the person of virtue, the person who has certain qualities and qualifications should in any case try his best to stay away from such actions where he's flattering other people or boasting in front of them. And he should keep doing istighfar so that he can continue to excel in goodness. Then the second point that we see here is that when you know that you can do something, offer your services. It becomes an obligation upon you that you offer your services where you're the only one capable of doing that work. When you're the only one who has that skill and nobody else has it, then it's an obligation upon you to offer yourself. Don't avoid and don't wait to be called. That when they call me, then I will offer myself because that, that is a type of the kabbur, it is a type of arrogance. And we find an example from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu at Khandak, when all the tribes of Arabia came to fight the Muslims and the surrounded Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam openly announced as to who would go and bring the news of the enemy. It was a very difficult time for the Muslims because all the tribes had come and they had laid siege in a way. They were surrounding the city of Medina. So when the Prophet of Allah asked for someone to go find the news of the enemy, Zubair ibn al-Awam offered himself. Again, the Prophet وسلم, asked, because this was a very dangerous mission. The winds were strong, it was very cold, so nobody was ready to go, so Zubair ibn al-Awam offered himself. So when the Prophet وسلم, asked again, again he said, I will, I will go and find out their news. And that the Prophet وسلم, said, verily, every prophet has a disciple, a hawari, and my disciple, my hawari, is a Zubair ibn al-Awam. So here we see an example of a companion offering his services in the way of Allah. So if you have something to offer, then you should offer yourself. And thus we establish Yusuf in the land. So now he had the same position as the Aziz of Misr. He became the finance minister to settle therein wherever he willed. So now there was a lot in his control. He could go wherever he wanted. We touch with our mercy whom we will, and we do not allow to be lost the reward of those who do good. And what was this good deed? What was this ihsan? It was his patience. It was the patience of Yusuf in the most difficult of situations. Patience in the well. Patience in front of the caravan who picked, it up, who picked him up from the well. Now you see, Yusuf didn't say to them, my brothers threw me in the well, I wanna go back, take me back to my father, nothing. Patience, then patience in slavery, then patience over haram, in that he didn't accept the call of the woman who was inviting him to evil, sabr. Then patience in the prison, as in when he was tested, he was patient throughout. And that was his ihsan, sabr, 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 every step of the way. So when a person is patient and he continues to do good, Allah will never waste his reward. He will see the fruits of his efforts in the dunya. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, the help of Allah comes in proportion to the hardship. The help of Allah comes in proportion to the hardship. And then patience is also given in proportion. It's also given in proportion to that as well. But who will get that patience? Who will get that sabr? The Prophet Sallallahu said, وَمَنْ يَتَصَبِّرْ يُسَبِّرْهُ اللَّهُ Whoever tries to be patient, Allah will give him patience. And it is with patience that hardships are removed. It is with patience that days change and good days come. Good days come with sabr. And the reward of the hereafter is better for those who believed and were fearing Allah. So here the reward of the akhirah is mentioned. If the reward is so huge in the dunya for sabr, then what do you think? would be the reward in the hereafter. From the reward in the dunya, you can have an idea of how great the reward would be in the hereafter.
and the brothers of Yusuf came seeking food. When Yusuf was appointed as the wazir, as the minister over the khaza'in of Misr, over the treasures of Misr, the storehouses of Misr, so he looked after the storehouses and he ensured the proper and adequate storage of food supplies in the first seven years as he had interpreted the dream of the king. Now the years of famine began. So when the years of famine began, these years were to last for seven years. In this, Egypt was prepared. But the people of the surrounding lands were not prepared. And they suffered from a great shortage of food supplies. And when people don't have food to eat, when people are going hungry, it causes them to look for food. Like you see little children at home, when they're hungry, what do they do? They're scouting the house for food. They're scouting through the pantry, through the refrigerator. They're looking for something to eat. So hunger causes us to look for food. So all people were in search for food because of the days of famine, the years of famine. And Yusuf salam, was famous for his food supplies as well as their distribution, their sales. So he had opened up all the storehouses and he sold grain to whoever came to him. So news of this also spread to Palestine, to Palestine. And so his brothers, they came to Egypt to purchase some grain. And they entered upon him, they entered upon Yusuf and he recognized them but he was to them unknown. Although Yusuf salam, recognized his brothers, his brothers didn't recognize him because they threw him in the well many, many years ago and never in their imagination would they have thought that the one who was sitting in front of them would be their brother Yusuf. And when he had furnished them with their supplies, he said, bring me a brother of yours from your father. And this was also sabr that he recognized his brothers but he didn't disclose his identity to them. Do you not see that I give full measure and that I am the best of accommodators? Now here he's not praising himself, but he's making them realize that you're welcome here. We have accommodated you now and we will do so in the future as well. But if you do not bring him to me, no measure will there be hereafter for you or for me, nor will you approach me. They said, we will attempt to dissuade his father from keeping him, and indeed we will do it. And Yusuf said to his servants, put their merchandise into their saddlebags so that they might recognize it when they have gone back to their people, that perhaps they will return again. Meaning what they had brought to purchase the grain was returned to them so that when they go back, they realize that their merchandise has been returned to them. So this would be an incentive for them to come back to Egypt again to get some more grain. So in a way, he did ihsan on them by giving them the grain for free. So when they returned to their father, they said, Oh, our father, further measure has been denied to us. So send with us our brother so that we will be given measure. And indeed, we will be his guardians. Because earlier, they didn't guard Yusuf, salam. So now they're reassuring their father that we will guard bin Yamin. Because you see, when a person has guilt inside of him, he keeps repeating that thing again and again. He said, should I entrust you with him, except under coercion, as I entrusted you with his brother before? But Allah is the best guardian. I don't rely on your guarding him. I rely on Allah. He is the best guardian. And he is the most merciful of the merciful. And this is why, if you fear losing anything, then entrust it to Allah and say these words, Fallahu khayrun hafidah. We should have conviction in this, that when you leave something to Allah, Allah will take care of it. He will preserve it. But many times, what do we think? We think that we can preserve and guard our things more. That if I put something in the locker, no one will take it. Now this does not mean that you don't put things in your locker you no, you have to take your means, you have to do your part, but then leave the matter to Allah. Sometimes it happens that the things that are in our hands even, we can't guard them. Someone snatches your bag from your hands, someone picks your pocket, although it was completely closed. Remember, if Allah does not guard, then there's nothing that we can do. So anytime you have fear, remind yourself, Allahu khayrun hafidah. Allah is the best guardian. 
whatever things you're always worried about, entrust them to Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu advised a man saying to him, if you intend to lie down in bed, then say the following words, Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilayk, wa fawwadtu amri ilayk, wa wajjahtu wajhi ilayk, wa aljahtu dhahri ilayk, raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk, la malja wa la manja minka illa ilayk. Amantu bi kitabika alladhi anzalta, wa bi nabiyika alladhi arsalta. O oh Allah, I have submitted myself to you. I have turned my face to you, entrusted my affairs to you, and relied completely on you out of desire for and fear of you. There is no resort and no deliver from hardships except you. I affirm my faith in your book, which you have revealed, and in your prophet whom you have sent. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you die during the night, you will, you will die on the true religion. If you die during the night, you will die on the true religion. Let these words be your last words at night. And if you should die then, you will die on the religion of Islam. So entrusting your entire self to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all your matters to him. And when they opened their baggage, they found their merchandise returned to them. They said, oh, our father, what more could we desire? This is our merchandise returned to us. And we will obtain supplies for our family and protect our brother and obtain an increase of a camel's load. That is an easy measurement. And now we're friends with them, so we can easily bring more rations. Yaqub said, never will I send him with you until you give me a promise by Allah that you will bring him back to me, unless you should be surrounded by enemies. And when they had given their promise, he said, Allah, over what we say is the witness. And this is a reality that when we make a promise with anyone, Allah is watching. Allah is a witness. And if a person turns away from it, if a person breaks it, then Allah will question him. Which is why when you make a promise with someone over something small or something big, don't go against it. And remember that Allah is a witness over what you have said. And he said, oh, my sons, do not enter from one gate, but enter from different gates. And I cannot avail you against the decree of Allah at all. The decision is only for Allah. Upon him I have relied. And upon him, let those who would rely indeed rely. Now, why did Yaqub say this? Because he feared that 11 young men, who were also very handsome, fit, healthy, all going together. So when people look at them with wonder, awe, then this can afflict the evil eye. You know, like when a person sees something amazing, you say, wow. So apart from hasid, the look of admiration can also afflict the evil eye. And the scholars, they say that this ayah contains proof that evil eye is real. The Prophet Sallallahu said, al haqq, the effect of an evil eye is a fact, it is true, it is real. And the evil eye can affect a person or property or a house or cars and even animals. In another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the evil eye sends a man to his grave and a camel into the cooking pot. And if the animal gets affected by the evil eye, falls sick and is then slaughtered and cooked. And the effects of the evil eye are sudden. It has sudden signs. It can affect objects. Like for example, you may see a beautiful lamp, light, you're admiring it and poof, it goes out. It can cause illness. It can cause loss. And your person is healthy, fine, but then he meets a particular person and the headache that starts right after that, whereas there's no other reason. Whereas there's no other reason, you just meet someone and as soon as you leave, you, you get this sharp pain in your head. So when there's no other reason for sudden effects, it's quite possible that it is the evil eye. Sometimes spots on the face could also be a result of the evil eye. Umm Salama radiallahu anha, she narrated, that the Prophet Sallallahu saw in her house a young girl whose face appeared yellowish. He said, seek Ruqya for her, 
because she's struck with an evil eye. And remember, the effect of the evil eye is sudden, instant. It's like an arrow. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah said in Zadul Ma'ad, it is an arrow shot by the one who's jealous or is known for giving evil eye towards the one who is envied. Hitting the target sometimes and missing it sometimes. So if it is encountered while uncovered and without protection, then the person is affected by it. But no doubt, if it is encountered while taking precaution, then it will not affect him. Rather, it may happen that this arrow, meaning the evil eye, is returned back to the owner himself. And what is the protection? The protection are the morning and evening adhkar. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu narrated, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to seek refuge from the evil eye of the jinn and the evil eye of humans. Then when the Mu'awwidatayn were revealed, he used them for seeking protection and left other than them. So what this tells us, if on some day you're really busy and you cannot read the other adhkar, so for example, uh, Fajr time, you wake up, you pray, but you get busy in something. And as we mentioned earlier, the morning adhkar are done after Fajr and before sunrise. And evening adhkar are done after Asr and before sunset. So Asr time, you prayed your Asr and you get so busy in something that you don't have the time for all the adhkar. If nothing yet, at least read the Mu'awwidatayn. If nothing else, at least recite the Mu'awwidatayn. And they make time for these surahs, morning and evening, and inshallah, they will be the greatest protection. And then we learn of a particular dua to treat the evil eye. This is reported in Musnad Ahmad that there were two companions who uh, went off to take a bath. And um, it is said that they went their own directions and they had put a curtain. So when one of them you know, perhaps he removed his shirt and the other one saw him and admired him. So when that happened, he heard a splash sound. Okay, a splash sound. And when he went to see his companion, he saw that he was waiting, waiting in the water, waiting as in, and he was floating in the water. And then he, he tried to wake him up, but he didn't. So he quickly went to the Prophet Sallallahu and he informed the Messenger of Allah of what happened. So when the Messenger of Allah came, he found that companion unconscious. So the Prophet Sallallahu then hit him on his chest with his hand and recited the following words on him. Allahumma sirif anhu harraha wa bardaha wa wasabaha. Oh Allah, remove from him its heat, its cold and its fatigue. And when the Prophet Sallallahu recited these words on him, the companion stood up. And then the Messenger of Allah said, if one of you sees in his brother or in himself or in his wealth, something that he likes, that which pleases him, you, know, you look at something nice, a nice car, a nice house, or a person who looks nice, for example, you see a bride, then ask Allah to bless it. Then he should ask Allah to bless it. Barakallahu fiki, barakallahu fika. Tabarakallah, ma sha Allah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. For verily, the evil eye is real. So this is the specific dua for evil eye. Allahumma sirif anhu harraha wa bardaha wa wasabaha. And sometimes you will see a, a child, a child starts crying and you can't figure out the reason. All of a sudden, the child just starts crying in the evening and you're wondering what's going on or some other part of the day. And then you think to yourself, okay, we went to that party in the afternoon. Perhaps it could be the evil eye. So start doing ruqya on the child. Ruqya means that you recite the ayat of the Quran and the masnoon du'as. Or if you notice unexplainable weakness in your child, child is refusing to eat and he's losing weight and you've been to the doctors and the doctors cannot pinpoint any reason. Again, it's possible it is the evil eye. So this dua is very beneficial. And that's because the Prophet Sallallahu read this dua and him reading this is not something ordinary. The Messenger of Allah received everything from wahi, from revelation. Anyhow, 
Yaqub alayhi salam, he does tadbir, he does planning, he tells them what to do. And then he says, in al hukmu illa lillah, the decision is only for Allah. Alayhi tawakkaltu, upon him I have relied. Wa alayhi fal yatawakkal al mutawakkilun. And upon him let those who would rely indeed rely. Now, despite adopting means, it is a must that you trust and rely on Allah. So Yaqub was teaching his children to trust, depend, and rely on Allah alongside adopting means. And when they entered from where their father had ordered them, it did not avail them against Allah at all. It was a need within the soul of Yaqub, which he satisfied. And indeed, he was a possessor of knowledge because of what we had taught him, but most of the people do not know. They don't have knowledge of these things. What Yaqub feared was what happened. And this is why it is important that you keep your thoughts positive. Because when a person has negative thoughts, there's something called the law of attraction. The way you think, things begin to happen that way. So first, you have to bring a change inside yourself. Make your thoughts positive. And the more positive your thoughts are, the more brave and strong you will be with the idin, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this braveness, this courage, this strength, and this confidence only comes with tawakkul, reliance, trust, taking Allah as your support, and by having husnul dhan, having good thoughts about Allah that everything will be fine. Inshallah, everything will be good. There'll be khair in this. Fallahu khairun hafidah. Allah is the best guardian. Allah protects. Even if the hardship comes, Allah is the one who will make a way out. Because sometimes it happens that you do all your protection du'as, but you end up in what was meant to be. And then you say, I did my du'as, we did istikhara, we made du'a to Allah, we did our part, we got our daughter married, but it didn't work out. So the istikhara didn't work. No, hardships can still come. Despite making du'a, despite doing istikhara, hardships can still come. Here the messenger, Yaqub did all that he could do. He did the planning, he told his children not to enter from one gate, but he had to face another calamity. But that too was temporary. And there was wisdom in that. The time passed and later there was so much ease. So even though you did istikhara and got married and a hardship comes, perhaps Allah is making you stronger through that situation. Some things you haven't learned in any book, but people teach you. Books cannot teach you, but people teach you. Some people enter your life who are so kind, caring, loving to you, and through their love, they teach you. And then there are some who are very difficult. Sometimes difficult people enter your life whose harsh behavior teaches you something. It makes you strong. It makes you firm. And the hearts anyways are in the hands of Allah. And good times will come. Ease will come. So never blame istikhara. Never blame du'as. There is khayr in that as well. Even if the situation didn't turn out according to your expectations, there is good in that. So when you do istikhara and do something after that, and it doesn't work out, there's actually khayr in that because you're asking Allah for khayr. Now, what is that which, that which you think is good? Okay. And perhaps you love a thing. But it is bad for you. It's not good for you. The problem is that we ourselves have defined what is good and what is bad. So good is what we think to be good. And situations that are unpleasant, we don't think there's any good in them. Whereas for a believer, all situations are good. When a blessing comes to him, he is grateful. He does shukr. And when a calamity reaches him, he is patient. He does sabr. And this is only for the believer. So we should be pleased with Allah in every situation and hope for good days to come. This too shall pass. The difficulty will pass. Ease will come. Good times will come. And remember, there's khayr in every decision. You do istikhara, you make a decision, even if apparently it doesn't go the way you expected, that too 
is khair. That too is good. And later on, you realize the wisdoms. You understand the wisdoms behind that situation. And when they entered upon Yusuf, he took his brother to himself. He said, indeed, I am your brother. So now the brothers came to Egypt. And when Yusuf salam, saw Binyamin, he brought him close to himself and said to him, whispered to him, or you know, privately said to him, indeed, I am your brother. So do not despair over what they used to do. And this is what it means to forgive. You know how we say that we have forgiven, but usually we just say words. We say, I have forgiven everyone. But we haven't taken out the ill feelings yet. We haven't taken out the grudges that we're still harboring in our heart. So when we still are holding on to those grudges and malice and ill feelings, then what kind of forgiveness is that? Now, Binyamin must have told Yusuf salam, what he had to endure after Yusuf was gone because he was from a different mother. Yusuf salam, and Binyamin were full brothers from a different mother, and the rest of the brothers were from another mother. So he must have gone through a lot as well, and perhaps he told Yusuf salam, about this, and he was also the youngest. Being the youngest sibling is not easy. It's painful at times. The youngest ones get bullied all the time. So and we don't know what all he had to go through at the hands of his brothers. Now these things, what he went through, is not mentioned here in the Quran. But this sentence of Yusuf salam, tells us, فَلَا بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ So do not despair over what they used to do. Such an amazing advice. Such amazing counseling. And there's goodness in this. Because when a person doesn't forgive, when a person doesn't forget, when he doesn't let go, then he's only harming himself. And research also shows that despairing, not forgiving, leads to a host of health issues. It leads to a host of mental issues as well. And that is why there's this saying, to forgive, to forgive is to set a prisoner free, only to discover that the prisoner is you. When we don't forgive, we have imprisoned ourselves. When we forgive, when we let go, we have freed ourselves. And remember, forgiving is not just saying some words but it is to also remove negative thinking from yourself. Because as soon as you remove anger, hatred, animosity, enmity, jealousy from yourself, it will be replaced with compassion, love, and friendship. Forgiving another doesn't change the past, but it changes the future. It doesn't change the past, but the future becomes beautiful. And again, it is very important to have positive thoughts. And this is why the Quran is healing for many ailments, because it changes the thought process. It changes the mindset. So never underestimate the power of thought. Willpower. Willpower. And what helps is making your concern the hereafter. When you make your concern the hereafter, then the griefs and the sorrows of this world will seem very small, will seem very trivial. And then you will say to yourself, why am I holding these grudges? Why am I carrying this heavy baggage with me everywhere I go? Only burdening myself. Then you will let go, you will forgive, and you will become free. So anyhow, Yusuf salam, said to his brother to ignore, to not despair, over what they used to do. So when, he had furnished them with, so when he had furnished them with their supplies, he put the gold measuring bowl into the bag of his brother, Binyamin. Then announcer called out, O oh, caravan, indeed you are thieves. They were just about to leave when they heard a voice from behind. They said while approaching them, what is it you're missing? They said, we're missing the measure of the king. And for he who produces it, is the reward of a camel's load, and I am responsible for it. They said, by Allah, you have certainly known that we did not come to cause corruption in the land, and we have not been thieves. The accuser said, 
then what would be its recompense if you should be liars? The brother said, its recompense is that he in whose bag it is found, he himself will be its recompense. Thus do we recompense the wrongdoers. According to the law of Egypt, they could not imprison a traveler. But in the law of Yaqub this was the law. So on this basis, they decided that whoever stole would be kept behind. So he began to search with their bags before the bag of his brother. Then he extracted it from the bag of his brother. Thus did we plan for Yusuf. Now this was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes you get great ideas, great inspirations, and you're like, I can do this, I can do that. Amazing ideas come to you. Now these ideas aren't just coming to you from yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inspiring you with those ideas. And when does this especially happen? Especially when you're praying, you get ideas. So anyhow, good ideas are from Allah. It is his support. It is his help. Thus did we plan for Yusuf. He could not have taken his brother within the religion of the king, except that Allah willed. We raise in degrees whom we will, but over every possessor of knowledge is one more knowing. Over every knowledgeable person, there is someone who has more knowledge. And the reason why this has been said is so that no person thinks that I am the most knowledgeable, that I have the most ilm, so that he doesn't become arrogant. And another way of understanding this is that over the ones who have the most knowledge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's knowledge encompasses everything. So when things don't make sense to us, we generally begin to question, object, criticize, wonder, why is this happening? Why does this happen? Why does that happen? And that's because we don't understand the wisdoms. We don't know the wisdoms behind these incidents. We're only humans. Our knowledge is limited. And that's why, because our knowledge is limited, we need to expel this sentence from our life, the sentence, it's not fair. It's not fair. This is not fair. That's not fair. And you hear kids saying this all the time. And then adults also say this. But we must remember that no decision of Allah is unfair. We don't know, but Allah knows. Also, when Allah gives knowledge to someone, whether it is a little or a lot, this is a sign of his love. The things of this world, Allah gives to everyone, whether Muslim or not. But the knowledge of the deen, the knowledge of religion, he only gives to the one whom he loves. The one with whom Allah intends good, he bestows upon him the understanding of the religion. So we should be very, very grateful to Allah for this huge blessing. They said, the brothers of Yusuf said, if he steals, if Binyamin steals, a brother of his has stolen before. Referring to Yusuf. What happens is that when you're jealous of someone, then you don't leave any opportunity to defame them. Years had gone by, but even now they're saying bad things about their brother because they had it in their hearts. But Yusuf kept it within himself and did not reveal it to them. And this is sabr, this is patience, to keep it within yourself so that people don't even know. Shallow people, nothing remains in their heart. They hear one thing and it's out the other. And this leads to so much facade and problems and conflicts and fights. Now there are some people who cannot contain or who cannot handle good news. So when a good news comes to them, in their excitement, they will tell everyone about it the whole world about it. And as a result, what happens? Hasid happens, evil eye happens. And then there's some people who cannot contain grief and sorrow and hurt from others, and they tell everyone about it. And especially now in this day and age with, with social media, everything is shared with everyone. After every few minutes, you know, people are updating their status on Facebook. I'm feeling sad right now. Then the next minute, I'm feeling angry right now. I'm feeling happy right now. I'm feeling bad right now. 
What other emojis do you have? You have so many different kinds of emojis, right? So this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling this, 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 this. After every few seconds, few minutes, or few hours. So all the time, uh, sharing one's feelings or sharing what is happening at home constantly, food, drink, vacation, this, that. But the question arises here, why? Does this benefit others? Does it increase anyone in knowledge? As a matter of fact, the opposite happens. The opposite happens that those who don't have those things in their lives, those who don't have that same kind of happiness, keep comparing themselves and then fall prey to grief, depression, anxiety, and it only increases their sadness. And it, the point of mentioning this is that we should not display our blessings in front of the whole world without any reason. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, فَإِنَّ كُلَّ ذِي نِعْمَةٍ مَحْسُودٍ Everyone who is given a blessing is envied. Every possessor of blessing is envied. Now you may think that because of sharing your blessings, people will love you more. People will be happy for you. Yes, some people will be happy for you, but then there'll be many others who are doing hasad as well. Now, having said this, this does not mean that we go to the other extreme because balance is important. This does not mean that you cannot share anything with anyone. When there's a purpose, then you can share. As Allah himself says in the Quran, And as for the blessing of your Lord, mention it, mention it, talk about it. So if you have some beneficial experience or a blessing or such tips, such advice that will benefit others, or you achieved and accomplished something, and this would motivate others, or a story of yours, of your personal life that will encourage others to good. And anything that has a benefit, then yes, you can share that with others so that it benefits them. So where needed, you can share. But if there's no reason, if there's no purpose, and you know this will be of no benefit to anyone, then it should be avoided. So a balance is very important. But Yusuf kept it within himself and did not reveal it to them. He said, and he said this to himself, not out loud, but within himself, you are worse in position and Allah is most knowing of what you describe, whether I actually stole or not. The fact is that those who recognize Allah then it becomes easier for them to hear the hurtful words of others. Here they were accusing Yusuf salam, who according to them was lost because they didn't know that he was standing right in front of them. On one side, they're showing honor and respect to the one who's in front of them, but then they're speaking evil of the Yusuf who was lost. So only that person can tolerate such things who has the strength of Iman. You know, some people say things like, I've had enough of so-and-so. I'm fed up with them. I can't deal with them anymore. That's a sign that Iman has dipped. So we need to work on our Iman. When Iman is less, then the capacity to tolerate also becomes less. And when Iman is more, when the recognition of Allah is more, then the capacity to tolerate also becomes more. They said, oh Aziz, just moments ago, they were calling him a thief. And to the same one, they say, ya ayyuhal Aziz, oh Aziz. Indeed, he has a father, and Ibn Yamin has a father who's an old man. So take one of us in place of him, don't take Ibn Yamin, because remember, their father took a promise from them and he was reluctant in the first place to send Binyamin with them. So here they plead, they say, don't take him, but take one of us instead. Indeed, we see you as a doer of good. Subhanallah. Yusuf salam, is known as a muhsin wherever he is. No matter where he is, his ihsan is acknowledged. So ihsan is not just a one-off quality. Ihsan is an attitude. 
Doing good is an attitude. He said, I seek the refuge of Allah to prevent that we take except him with whom we found our possession. Indeed, we would then be unjust. So when they had despaired of him, they secluded themselves in private consultation. The eldest of them said, the eldest brother, the same one who had earlier said not to kill Yusuf, but to throw him in the well, he said, do you not know that your father has taken upon you an oath by Allah and that before you failed in your duty to Yusuf? So I will never leave this land. Yani I cannot go with this face to my father. I will never leave this land until my father permits me or Allah decides for me and he is the best of judges. Because at the end of the day, they were the children of a prophet. Return to your father and say to him, O oh, our father, indeed your son has stolen. And we did not testify except to what we knew. We don't know about what really happened, but we're basing this on the apparent. And we were not witnesses of the unseen. And ask the city in which we were and the caravan in which we came. And indeed we are truthful because at that time people would travel as a group. So if you don't believe us, ask the people of the caravan who came with us from Egypt. So they had to convince their father of the truthfulness because they had lost their trust long time ago. Yaqub said, rather your souls have enticed you to something. So he didn't trust them because of the previous experience. So patience is most fitting. Perhaps Allah will bring them to me all together. Indeed, he Indeed, it is he who is the knowing, the wise. Now, three sons are lost. The eldest son, who refused to leave without Binyamin. Then Binyamin was, was basically kept behind. And Yusuf salam, was lost from before. Sabrun Jamil is a patience in which there's no complaints. And it is a continuous patience. Now the incidents that are mentioned here are what Allah has told us in the Quran, but all those incidents that are not mentioned, yani what all would Yaqub have gone through on a daily basis with patience, with his children? Because when children are like this, then their behavior doesn't just show once a year, it shows on a daily basis. And every year, or sorry, every day, on a daily basis, he would be ad adopting a great amount of patience. So anyhow, he was patient throughout. And he says, perhaps Allah will bring them to me all together. Indeed, it is he who is the knowing the wise. And this is Allah's way that when, a, that when a matter becomes very difficult, when a matter becomes very difficult, it becomes easy. So when the situation became very difficult for Yaqub Allah created ease for him and he turned away from them and he turned away from them and um, this could be you know what this means is that he did not uh, pursue them he did not interrogate them and this should be the way because responding in such a situation does not benefit a person and he said, Ya Asafa ala Yusuf, oh my sorrow over Yusuf. And his eyes became white with grief. His eyes became white from grief. So what this tells us is that it's okay to cry. It's okay to express grief, but only to the extent of crying. Like the Prophet Sallallahu when his son Ibrahim passed away, he cried. And when the Sahaba asked him about this, he said, this is mercy. The eyes shed tears, the heart grieves, but we will not say anything except that by which Allah is pleased. O oh, Ibrahim, we are grieved for you. So at the time of distress, feeling grief and sadness doesn't contradict patience. But what is not allowed is wailing, screaming, complaining, getting out of control. Oh, my sorrow over Yusuf and his eyes became white from grief for he was of that a suppressor. They said, by Allah, you will not cease remembering Yusuf until you become fatally ill or become of those who perish. Qala, he said, innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah. I only complain of my suffering and my grief to Allah. Bath, 
Death is intense grief. It's not ordinary grief. Intense grief. I complain of my suffering and my grief to Allah alone. And I know from Allah that which you do not know. Look at the positive thoughts that he had about Allah. And this is what increases a person's strength and resolve. Oh, my sons, go and find out about Yusuf and his brother and despair not of relief from Allah. Indeed, no one despairs of relief from Allah except the disbelieving people. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O Messenger of Allah, what are the kaba'ir? What are the major sins? He said, the kaba'ir are shirk with Allah, giving up hope of relief from Allah and despair from the mercy of Allah. And this is when a person thinks that a situation is not going to get better. It's not going to get fixed. There's no hope. Or even in someone else's case, to think that so-and-so will never change, or so-and-so will never understand, or he's a hopeless case. No, don't give up concerning yourself, nor should you give up concerning others. And never despair of circumstances changing. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, our Lord laughs at the despair of his servants as he will soon change it. The narrator says, I said, O Messenger of Allah, does our Lord laugh? The Prophet said, yes. I said, we can never give up of goodness from a Lord who laughs, from a Lord who smiles. Now, when you think of Allah, what do you think of? Do you think of awe, majesty, power, authority? But also think of a Lord who smiles especially when one is about to despair. Why does Allah smile? Because the change is so near. The change is so close, but a person gives up. It's like there's only four steps left and the situation will become better, but the person stops there. No, don't stop. Continue just a little more, a little more sabr. And soon Allah will provide relief. Allah will make a way out. So when they entered upon Yusuf, they said, Oh, Aziz, adversity has touched us in our family. And we have come with goods poor in quality, but give us full measure and be charitable to us. Indeed, Allah rewards the charitable. He said, Do you know what you did with Yusuf and his brother when you were ignorant? When you were ignorant, subhanAllah. He gives them the benefit of the doubt. His enemies are standing right in front of him those who are jealous of him. And he speaks to them in such a kind and polite and nice way. Our problem is that we don't give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't think that so-and-so doesn't know any better. He's jahil, he's ignorant, so just ignore. We don't know how to do this. And we will assume the worst about the other person. So when you face the situations, when you hear such things, then just think, this person is ignorant. He doesn't know. And when you think like this, you won't feel it too much. It won't hurt that much. So what is needed is kind behavior, gentleness. The Prophet Sallallahu said, verily, gentleness is not found in anything, but that it beautifies it. And it is not removed from anything, but that it disgraces it. In another narration, he said, Oh, Aisha, Allah is gentle and he loves gentleness. He rewards for gentleness what is not granted for harshness, and he does not reward anything else like it. So Yusuf salam, said to them, Do you know what you did with Yusuf and his brother when you were ignorant? So now the brothers realize, Okay, this must be Yusuf. Qalu, they said, A'innaka la'anta Yusuf? Are you indeed Yusuf? Qala, he said, Ana Yusuf. I am Yusuf. Wahada akhi, and this is my brother. Qad mannallahu alayna. Allah has certainly favored us. Indeed, he who fears Allah and is patient, then indeed Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of those who do good. Subhanallah. How patient was he? 
And then we also learn from this the keys to success. There are two keys to success, taqwa and sabr. إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَسْبِرُ Taqwa and sabr. Then indeed, Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of those who do good. So we see that there are three qualities that are very prominent in Yusuf alayhi salam. Number one, taqwa. Number two, sabr, sabr in everything. And number three, ihsan, that he worked at the level of excellence. He worked at the level of benevolence. So we should adopt these qualities in ourselves as well, knowing, believing, being convinced that Allah will not waste the reward of those who have these qualities. They said, by Allah, certainly Allah has preferred you over us. So now they acknowledge. And indeed, we have been sinners. Qala, he said, la alaykum al -yawm. No blame will there be upon you today. And this is what it means to forgive. So if you want to know what it means to forgive, learn that from Yusuf salam. After today, I will make no mention of this. We will not talk about this. Chapter closed, book closed, pages turned. We're not going to go back. I will not mention this to you after this day. This mistake of yours will never be mentioned again. The problem with us is that we say, okay, I've forgiven you. Someone comes, apologizes, I've forgiven you. But if 10 days later, they, you know, husband-wife relationship, maybe husband perhaps scolds his wife, gets angry, upset, and after a day, he feels really bad about what he's done. He apologizes. He says, I'm sorry. Wife says, it's okay. I forgive you. Or vice versa. After 10 days, when the husband scolds, shouts, does whatever, the wife gets upset and she brings up the whole past. Or the husband, if he faces that from his wife, he brings up the whole past. Either way, I mean, any relationship, we say that we have forgiven, but when someone does the same thing again, we bring up the past again. That's not what it means to forgive. Forgive means that what happened in the past remains in the past. Not mentioning those mistakes, not mentioning those sins. And this is what the Prophet said to the people of Mecca at the time of the conquest. At a time when he was the Fatih, okay, he, he was entering Mecca as a Fatih. He could have taken revenge. He could have taken, because he had the authority, he could have taken revenge from all of those people who had wronged them for many years, but he forgave them. And he said these same words to them. So forgiving those who have wronged you is an attribute of the prophets of Allah. And remember, forgiving only raises your ranks. The Prophet ﷺ said, no one forgives except that Allah increases his honor. Allah will forgive you and he is the most merciful of the merciful. Take this my shirt and cast it over the face of my father. He will become seeing. His grief began with his shirt and it ended with his shirt. Sometimes the very thing that harms a person becomes a means of benefit for him. The same thing can be a cause of misery and it can be a cause of happiness. Today someone may hurt you, offend you, harm you, insult you, wrong you, but if you forgive them, whether it is your own child or your brother or your sister, or your daughter-in-law, then tomorrow they will become your greatest supporter. That's the benefit of forgiving. Take this my shirt and cast it over the face of my father. He will become seeing and bring me your family all together. Bring everyone here to Egypt. And when the caravan departed from Egypt, their father said, indeed, I find the smell of Yusuf. And I would say that he was alive if you did not think me weakened in mind. Now this was Allah's idin, this was Allah's permission. Yusuf salam was in the well, so close to Kanaan, so close to his father, but his father didn't smell him. Because it wasn't the permission of Allah. 
Now the caravan had just left Egypt. He's very far from his father, and the shirt is very far, and he sends to Yusuf alayhi salam. And this is something that we all experience. You know, sometimes you sense something before it happens. Either it's a thought that comes to you, or it's a feeling, or you see something in your dream. You sense it, and then it happens. And when that happens, don't start to think that I'm waliullah, I'm very pious, very righteous. Because sometimes it also happens that something is right in front of you. It's right in front of your eyes, but you don't see it. Both things happen. So anyhow, Yaqub was a prophet of Allah. And he says, indeed, I find the smell of Yusuf. And I would say that he was alive if you did not think me weakened in mind. They said, by Allah, indeed, you are in your same old error. And when the bearer of good tidings arrived, he cast it over his face. He cast the shirt over his face and he returned once again seeing. It wasn't the shirt, it was Allah's permission. It was Allah's will. And the shirt was just a means. He said, did I not tell you that I know from Allah that which you do not know? They said, oh, our father, ask for us forgiveness of our sins. Indeed, we have been sinners. We were wrong. We made a mistake. So what this tells us is that for repentance, a person should first of all acknowledge that he was wrong. I was wrong. I made a mistake and apologize. He said, I will ask forgiveness for you from my Lord. So I will do this, not right away, but I will do this. And Yaqub intended to seek forgiveness at the time of suhoor, because that is the time of acceptance of du'as, especially du'as for forgiveness. Indeed, it is he who is the forgiving, the merciful. Yaqub forgave. Yusuf also forgave. They were the prophets of Allah, and that's why they were chosen. And Allah knows who has these qualities, and he knows where to place prophethood. And when they entered upon Yusuf, he took his parents to himself and said, enter Egypt, Allah willing, safe and secure. So he came out to meet his parents and he brought them in and he raised his parents upon the throne and they bowed to him in prostration. And this was a prostration of respect and honor, which was permissible in their Sharia. It was permissible in their legislation, but this is not permissible for us. So much so that when we meet someone, we should not even bend for that person, but rather you shake hands, you say the salam. And he said, oh my father, this is the explanation of my vision of before. This is the interpretation of my dream, the dream that he saw when he was a young boy, the dream that he saw many, many years ago. It started with a dream and now it's concluding with the interpretation of the dream. After many years, it was fulfilled. My Lord has made it a reality and he was certainly good to me when he took me out of the prison and brought you here from Bedouin life after shaitan had induced, after shaitan had induced estrangement between me and my brothers. So you see, sometimes he blames the nafs and sometimes shaitan, but he doesn't blame his brothers. And all, that's also part of his, his wisdom. Indeed, my Lord is subtle in what he wills. He does what he intends. And he's very subtle in that. Latif, that the human being doesn't even understand. He doesn't even realize the, will, the, the, the wisdoms behind it. So Allah does what he intends and the person doesn't even know what's going on. And only when the dots connect, then he understands that this was the picture being made. Indeed, it is he who is the knowing, the wise. رَبِّ قَدْ آتَيْتَنِي مِنَ الْمُلْكِ وَعَلَّمْتَنِي مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَدِيثِ فَاطِرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَنْتَ وَلِيِّ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ My Lord, you have given me something of sovereignty and taught me of the interpretation of dreams. Creator of the heavens and the earth, you are my protector in this world and in the hereafter. Cause me to die a Muslim 
and join me with the righteous. Here he's not asking for death, but basically what he's saying is that whenever I die, let me die on Islam. Because no matter what achievements, what accomplishments a person gets in this world, if his end is not good, then it's all useless. Which is why make dua for a good end. And there are many du'as for this. One of them, Allahumma ahsin aqibatana fil umuri kulliha wa ajirna min khizi dunya wa adab al akhirah. O Allah, grant a good end to all our matters and save us from humiliation in the world and the punishment of the hereafter. Then also another du'a, Allahumma tawaffana muslimin. وَأَحْيِنَا مُسْلِمِينَ وَأَلْحِقْنَا بِالصَّالِحِينَ غَيْرَ خَزَاقَ وَلَا مَفْتُونِينَ O oh Allah, make us die Muslims and make us live as Muslims and join us with the righteous who are neither disappointed nor afflicted. And then, what was the last dua of the Prophet Sallallahu اللهم اغفر لي وارحمني وألحقني بالرفيق الأعلى O oh Allah, forgive me and have mercy on me and let me join with the highest companion. So we should continue to make dua for a good companionship in the dunya and also after death. وألحقني بالصالحين that is from the news of the unseen which we reveal to you, O Prophet. And you were not with them when they put and you were not with them when they put together their plan while they conspired. The address here is to the Prophet that when all of this happened, you were not there witnessing it. And most of the people, all you strive for it, are not believers. And you do not ask of them for it any payment. It is not except a reminder to the world. And how many a sign within the heavens and the earth do they pass over while they therefrom are turning away? And most of them believe not in Allah except while they associate others with Him. And this is why it is so important to know the Wahid, to know about Allah's oneness and to protect ourselves from shirk. Then do they feel secure that there will not come to them an overwhelming aspect of the punishment of Allah? or that the hour will not come upon them suddenly while they do not perceive? Say to them, this is my way. I invite to Allah with insight, I and those who follow me. And exalted is Allah, and I'm not of those who associate others with him. I'm not of those who commit shirk. And we sent not before you as messengers, except men. Meaning women were not sent as messengers because it's a very heavy responsibility. So only men were sent as messengers to whom we reveal from among the people of the cities. So have they not traveled through the earth and observed how was the end of those before them? And the home of the hereafter is best for those who fear Allah, then will you not reason? They continued until when the messengers despaired and were certain that they had been denied, there came to them our victory and whoever we willed was saved, and our punishment cannot be repelled from the people who are criminals. There was certainly in their stories a lesson for those of understanding. Never was the Quran a narration invented, but a confirmation of what was before it, and a detailed explanation of all things, and guidance, and mercy for people who believe. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the ever merciful. Alif Lam Mim Ra. Tilka Ayatul Kitab. These are the verses of the book, and what has been revealed to you from your Lord is the truth, but most of the people do not believe. It is Allah who erected the heavens without pillars that you can see. Then he established himself above the throne and made subject the sun and the moon each running its course for a specified term. He arranges each matter. He details the signs so that you may, of the meeting with your Lord, be certain. So remember, the sun and the moon are created by Allah, and he has subjugated them for the benefit of people. And specifically, the sun and the moon are prominent signs which are visible, signs that can be seen. And it is he who spread the earth and placed therein firmly set mountains and rivers. And from all of the fruits he made therein two mates, he causes the night to cover the day. Indeed, in that are signs for people who give thought. 
and within the land are neighboring plots and gardens of grapevines and crops and palm trees growing several from a root or otherwise, watered with one water. But we make some of them exceed others in quality of fruit. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who reason. SubhanAllah. It's one soil, one seed, one water, one sun, one tree, one fruit, but one is small and one is big. One is sweet and one is sour. And if you're astonished, O Prophet, then astonishing is their saying, when we are dust, will we indeed be brought into a new creation? Those are the ones who have disbelieved in their Lord, and those will have shackles upon their necks, and those are the companions of the fire, they will abide therein eternally. They impatiently urge you to bring about evil before good, while there has already occurred before them similar punishments to what they demand. And indeed, your Lord is full of forgiveness for the people despite their wrongdoing. And indeed, your Lord is severe in penalty. Because if Allah was to seize everyone for their sins, then no one would remain alive. So here, the balance between hope and fear is mentioned. Allah forgives and pardons, overlooks, even though people make mistakes day and night. And then he also punishes. So the reason why this has been mentioned is so that people live between hope and fear. And out of the two, out of hope and fear, hope should be more. Because sometimes people are so worried about their sins that they become hopeless. No, a person should never give up hope. The Prophet Sallallahu said, none of you should die except that he has good thoughts about Allah. Anas radiallahu anhu narrated, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered upon a young man who was dying. And he said to him, how do you feel? He said, I have hope in Allah, O Messenger of Allah, but I fear my sins. The Messenger of Allah said to him, these two things, meaning hope and fear, do not coexist in the heart of a person in a situation like this, but Allah will give him that which he hopes for and keep him safe from that which he fears. So in any case, hope should be more and have positive thoughts about Allah. Good thoughts, good thoughts should be more than remaining worried all the time. And those who disbelieve say, why has the sign not been sent down to him from his Lord? You're only a warner and for every people is a guide. Allah knows what every female carries and what the wombs lose prematurely or exceed and everything with him is by due measure. Now you will notice something in the surah. You will notice the mention of opposites, the sun and the moon, hope and fear, and here what the wombs carry and what they lose. <coughs> he is knower of the unseen and the witnessed, again opposites, the grand, the exalted. It is the same to him concerning you whether one conceals his speech or one publicizes it, again opposites concealing and revealing, and whether one is hidden by night or conspicuous among others by day. So night and day. For each one are successive angels before and behind him. Again, two things are mentioned here, before and behind. Who protect him by the decree of Allah. Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. And when Allah intends for a people ill, there's no repenting it and there's not for them besides him any patron. Now here a very beautiful point is mentioned that every person has appointed before him and behind him guardian angels with Allah's permission. We don't even know, we can't see them and they're guarding us from jinn, from insects and likewise other things. Mujahid said, every human has an angel appointed over him who guards him during sleep and wide awake from jinn, humans, and insects, except for what Allah has willed, then it reaches him. Kab Ahbar said, if Allah did not appoint angels over you who defend you in your eating, drinking, and matters of privacy, then the jinn would snatch you away. So guardian angels that are guarding by permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, they're angels who are guarding our deeds, meaning they're recording them, writing them down. 
The Prophet Sallallahu said, for every person who's afflicted by troubles in his body, some sickness, illness, ailment, Allah orders his keepers, the kiram and katibin, he orders them, write down for my slave each day and night the same good deeds as he has done before, as long as he's imprisoned in my bond, meaning in sickness. So even though he's prevented right now from performing those good deeds because of the sickness, but continue to write those deeds for him. It is he who shows you lightning causing fear and aspiration. Again, opposites are mentioned, fear and aspiration. And lightning is something in which there is warning as well as hope and generates the heavy clouds. And the thunder exalts Allah with praise of him. So the sound that we hear after lightning, that sound is a sound of thunder exalting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels as well from fear of him. Then Ra'ad, Ra'ad is also the name of an angel who drives the clouds. And he sends thunderbolts and strikes their with, and strikes there with whom he wills, while they dispute about while they dispute about Allah, and he is severe in assault. Lahu da'watul haq. To him alone is the supplication of truth. And those they call upon besides him. Do not respond to them with a thing, except as one who stretches his hands towards water from afar, calling to it to reach his mouth, but it will not reach it. And the supplication of the disbelievers is not but in error, futile, useless. Remember, when a person calls on any other than Allah, they don't respond to him. So spreading one's hands in front of false gods is like spreading your hands in front of water calling the water to come to your mouth, just the way the water will not jump into your mouth, in the same way, these gods will not benefit a person because they're lifeless, powerless, helpless. And to Allah prostrates whoever is within the heavens and the earth, willingly or by compulsion, and their shadows as well in the mornings and the afternoons. Now here the wisdom behind prostration has been mentioned. Say, who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth? Say, Allah. Say to them, have you then taken besides him allies, not possessing even for themselves any benefit or any harm? Say, is the blind equivalent to the seeing? Or is darkness equivalent to light? Or have they attributed to Allah partners who created like his creation so that the creation of each seemed similar to them? Say to them, O Prophet, Allah is the creator of all things, and he is the one, the prevailing. He sends down from the sky rain, and valleys flow according to their capacity. And the torrent carries a rising foam, and from that ore, which they heat in the fire, desiring ornaments and utensils, is a foam like it. Thus Allah presents the example of truth and falsehood. As for the foam, it vanishes, being cast off. But as for that which benefits the people, it remains on the earth. Thus does Allah present examples. The example that is mentioned here is a beautiful example, a beautiful parable, that each person takes a share of the knowledge. Each person takes a share of the knowledge that Allah has sent according to his capacity. Some take more and some take less. Some retain it and others forget it. So the valleys that are mentioned here are the hearts. The big valley is like the big heart, which is filled with a huge amount of knowledge, whereas a small valley is like a small heart, which has little knowledge. The heart has desire. And the more desire there is in the heart, the more capacity there will be for ilm, for knowledge. And the greater the desire, the bigger the space. And so a person is not satiated. He's not satisfied. He wants more and more and more. And then when the torrent flows, the foam rises to the surface. The same happens to the heart. When knowledge begins 
to flow through the heart, then doubts and questions surface themselves. Those buried thoughts that were asleep rise up. And if the water continues to flow, then the scum, the dirt, the filth, the twigs will be cast off to the side, leaving behind the purest form of water. So if a person keeps gaining knowledge with patience, then the doubts and the questions and the filth of hypocrisy and jealousy, all these things will be removed. They will get resolved gradually and the heart is purified. But if the torrent stops, then the foam on, the foam on the standing water becomes a breeding ground for more filth. So instead of becoming beautiful, it gets dirty. And that is why it is so important to keep the knowledge flowing because that would be a means of purification of the hearts. Similarly, the next example is the example of gold being heated. When gold is heated, the impurities leave and only the purest form remains behind. And that is what is beneficial for the people. So what is of use to people shall remain. Pure water and pure gold. And the filth of impurities will subside and dwindle away. That will be discarded. So knowledge that is used to benefit people will be retained. You won't forget it. And people that benefit others. Communities that benefit others are the ones that remains. I mean, what is of value, quality, strength is what will survive. For those who have responded to their Lord is the best reward. But those who did not respond to him, if they had all that is in the earth entirely and the like of it with it, they would attempt to ransom themselves thereby. Those will have the worst account. Worst account. Su'ul hisab. And su'ul hisab means a hisab in which nothing is forgiven. And it's a detailed investigation, interrogation. And their refuge is hell, and wretched is the resting place. Then is he who knows that which has been revealed to you from your Lord is the truth, like one who is blind. They will only be reminded who are people of understanding. So again, there's a comparison here. And who are the people of understanding? Who are the people of intelligence? Those who fulfill the covenant of Allah. And what is meant by Ahad of Allah here is the Ahad Alas, the covenant of Alas, which we read about, which we read about in Surah Al-Araf. And also saying, La ilaha illallah. So they fulfill the covenant of Allah and they do not break the contract. And those who join that which Allah has ordered to be joined and fear their Lord and are afraid of the evil of their account. And the reference here is towards ties of kinship. Those who join what Allah has ordered to be joined. The one who fears Allah and joins the ties of kinship, then his life will be prolonged and his family will also begin to love him. And when you do good to your relatives, in response, they will love you. The Prophet ﷺ said, the one who gives as much gifts for ties of kinship Allah increases his wealth in proportion. But isn't it the most difficult to spend on relatives? It's still easier to spend on your friends, on strangers and people whom you don't know. But when it comes to spending on relatives and their children, it seems very hard. But in any case, do this. And do this in this month of Ramadan. Make a list of your relatives, especially those who are needy. Spend on them. Send them a gift. You can even give Eid money, you know, to the children of the family. And, and the benefit of Eid money, you know, when Eid comes, if you're able, you know, inshallah, by that time things are better and we're able to meet family and friends and whatnot. So when you meet them, uh, give them some, some Eid money to make them happy. And then they also remember you, you know, they say later on, our grandmother or our grandfather used to give us aid money. It's just you know, a small amount just to make them happy. So when you spend on others, when you give to others, it's only benefit upon benefit in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. And those who are patient, seeking the countenance of their Lord, and establish prayer and spend from what we have provided for them secretly and publicly and prevent evil with good. Prevent evil with good. When you make a mistake, 
immediately follow it up with a good deed, with a good action. And if you've hurt someone, right away say sorry. You know this word sorry, it's a very small word. It's just one word. It's probably the most difficult word to say. And for this, you have to humble yourself. So if you made a mistake, if you hurt someone, just say, sorry. Follow up and evil with good. And if someone has wronged you, then respond to them with good. Those will have the good consequence of this whole, yani, a good outcome in the hereafter. And what is that home? Jannat or Adin, gardens of perpetual residence. They will enter them with whoever were righteous among their fathers, their spouses, and their descendants. And the angels will enter upon them from every gate, saying, Salamun alaykum, peace be upon you, bima sabartum, for what you patiently endured. You were patient on hardships. And remember, Jannah is a reward for patience. Fani'ma uqbadar, and excellent is the final home. On the contrary, so again, opposites are mentioned here. But those who break the covenant of Allah after contracting it and sever that which Allah has ordered to be joined and spread corruption on the earth, for them is curse and they will have the worst home. Astaghfirullah. They neither gave the haq of Allah nor did they give the haq of people. So they will have adab in the dunya and punishment in the hereafter awaits them. Allah extends provision for whom he wills and restricts it. And they rejoice in the worldly life. They only worry about the life of this world, while the worldly life is not, compared to the hereafter, except brief enjoyment. It's not even a drop compared to the ocean. And those who disbelieve say, why has a sign not been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, O Prophet, indeed Allah leaves astray whom he wills and guides to himself whoever turns back to him. Those who have believed and whose hearts are assured by the remembrance of Allah. Unquestionably, by the remembrance of Allah, hearts are assured. Try this. Anytime you feel anxious, worried, start doing dhikr. Start reading the Quran until that feeling goes away. Dhikr is the sustenance of the heart. Dhikr is the provision of the soul. Just the way we need food for our physical body, we need dhikr, Quran, for our soul. The believers are assured by the remembrance of Allah. And if the heart is not assured with dhikr, then we need to check the state of our iman. Because when iman is there, then dhikr will definitely benefit. And the greatest means to attain contentment and peace is the Qur'an. Who are those who do dhikr? Alladina amanu, those who have believed, wa'amilu salihat, and done righteous deeds, tuba lahum, a good state is theirs, wa husnu ma'ab, and a good return. Then have we sent you to a community before, which other communities have passed on? So you might recite to them that which we reveal to you, while they, dispe- while they disbelieve in the most merciful. Say to them, O Prophet, he is my Lord. There's no deity except him. Upon him I rely, and to him is my return. And if there was any Quran by which the mountains would be removed, or the earth would be broken apart, or the dead would be made to speak, it would be this Quran. You know, even if such miracles were shown to them, they would not accept. But to Allah belongs the affair entirely then have those who believe not accepted that had Allah willed, he would have guided the people, all of them. And those who disbelieve do not cease to be struck for what they have done by calamity, or it will descend near their home until there comes the promise of Allah. Indeed, Allah does not fail in his promise. And already were other messengers ridiculed before you, and I extended the time of those who disbelieved. Then I seized them, and how terrible was my penalty. Then is he who is a maintainer of every soul, knowing what it has earned, like any other. But to Allah they have attributed partners. O Prophet, say to them, name them. Or do you inform him of that which he knows not upon the earth or of what is apparent of speech? Rather, their own plan has been made attractive to those who disbelieve, and they have been averted from the way. And whomever Allah leaves astray, 
there will be for him no guide. Now this was their plot, that they had made their false gods, their gods besides Allah. For them will be punishment in the life of this world, and the punishment of the hereafter is more severe, and they will not have from Allah any protector. The example of paradise with the the example of paradise which the righteous have been promised is that beneath it rivers flow. Its fruit is lasting and its shade. That is the consequence for the righteous and the consequence for the disbelievers is the fire. And the believers among those to whom we have given the previous scripture rejoice, as, rejoice at what has been revealed to you, O prophet. But among the opposing factions are those who deny part of it, meaning they don't believe in all of it. Say to them, a prophet, I have only been commanded to worship Allah and not associate anything with him. To him I invite and to him is my return. And thus we have revealed it as an Arabic legislation. Hukman Arabiya. And if you should follow their inclinations after what has come to you of knowledge, you would not have against Allah any ally or any protector. And we have already sent messengers before you and assigned to them wives and descendants. And it was not for a messenger to come with a sign except by permission of Allah. For every term is a decree. Allah eliminates what he wills or confirms and with him is the mother of the book. So we learn from this that divine decree is in the hands of Allah. Dua changes decree. Similarly, joining ties of kinship also benefits a person in that it prolongs his life. And that too is in the knowledge of Allah. And whether we show you part of what we promise them or take you in death, upon you is only the duty of notification and upon us is the account. Have they not seen that we sat upon the land reducing it from its borders? And this happens in two ways, that literally the earth is physically constricting on them Okay. Physically, the earth is shrinking, constricting, and in the intangible sense that many people are becoming Muslim, and so their borders are reducing. And Allah decides there's no adjuster of his decision, and he is swift in account. And those before them had plotted, but to Allah belongs the plan entirely. He knows what every soul earns, and the disbelievers will know for whom is the final home as soon as they close their eyes. You know, these people, as soon as they close their eyes, the reality will come forth. They will see the truth. And they will come to know for whom is the final home. And those who have disbelieved say, you are not a messenger. Say, O oh, prophet, sufficient is Allah as witness between me and you and the witness of whoever has knowledge of the scripture. And he also recognizes that I am Allah's messenger. Surah Ibrahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the ever merciful. Alif Lam Ra, Kitabun Anzalnahu Ilaik, Litukhrijan Nasa Minal Vulumati Ila Nur, Bi Idni Rabbihim, Ila Siratil Aziz Al Hamid, Alif Lam Ra. This is a book which we have revealed to you, O Prophet that you might bring mankind out of darknesses into the light, from darknesses of ignorance, darkness of disbelief, darkness of depression, darkness of despair. The book, the Quran, takes out from all these darknesses and brings one into the light. That's the purpose of this book. By permission of their Lord, to the path of the exalted in might, the praiseworthy, meaning towards the straight path. Allah to whom belongs whatever's in the heavens and whatever's on the earth, and woe to the disbelievers from a severe punishment, the ones who prefer the worldly life over the hereafter. Yani, when both are in front of him, he chooses the life of this world, and he throws the hereafter behind him, and avert people from the way of Allah, seeking to make it seem deviant, those are an extreme error. Now here the word yastahibuna has been used, to love the dunya, to love the world, to use it in wrong ways. So the one who prefers the life of this world over the hereafter, the one who wants to remain in the blessings of this world, and alongside that he stops people from the way of Allah, then they're far from the truth. They have lost the way. 
And we did not send any messenger except speaking in the language of his people so that there's no language barrier. Because if the messenger spoke a different language than the language of the people, then he would not be able to communicate to them and they would not be able to understand what the messenger is saying to them. And the purpose was to state clearly for them so that the message goes through and Allah sends astray thereby whom he wills and guides whom he wills and he is the exalted and might the wise. And we certainly sent Musa with our sign saying, bring out your people from darknesses into the light and remind them of the days of Allah. Indeed, in that are signs for everyone patient and grateful. Whether good times or difficult times, these are tests. These are tests from Allah. So when you're grateful at good times and patient at difficult times, then Allah makes the path easier for you. Allah also gives you the ability to do good. And what is shukr? Inna fi dhalika la ayatil li kulli sabbarin shakur. What is shukr? Shukr basically means to recognize the blessings of Allah with humility. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions a beautiful description of gratitude. He says, it is the acknowledgement. Yani what is shukr? What is gratitude? It is the acknowledgement of the favors of the benefactor. Benefactor is the one who gives the blessing in the form of submission. So how do you acknowledge the blessings? In the form of submission, humility, and love for him. That is shukr. So whoever does not acknowledge the blessing is in fact ignorant of it and is not grateful for it. So the one who doesn't even recognize a blessing, he's ignorant of the blessing, first of all, and therefore he's not grateful. The one who recognizes the blessing, but does not recognize the benefactor, he too has not been grateful. Yeah, and a person knows that this is a blessing in my life, but he doesn't connect it to the one who gave him the blessing, then that is also ingratitude. The one who recognizes the blessing. Okay, so the one who, rec we did this already. The one who recognizes the blessing and the benefactor. So he recognizes the blessing as well as the one who gives him the blessing, but rejects the blessing. It's like the denier who rejects the favor of the benefactor. Therefore, he too has been ungrateful. Meaning he knows that it is a blessing and he knows about the one who gave him the blessing, but he doesn't express shukr for it. He doesn't express gratitude for it. He complains that he has also been ungrateful. Whoever recognizes the blessing and the benefactor acknowledges it and does not reject it, but does not adopt humility and love for him, nor is he pleased with him and the blessing, he too has not been grateful. Yani, he knows it's a blessing, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he doesn't humble himself before Allah. He does not praise Allah for it. He doesn't say alhamdulillah, then he too has not been grateful. And then he says, whoever recognizes the blessing and the benefactor, acknowledges it and submits to the benefactor, loves him and is pleased with him and also the blessing, and utilizes it in his love and obedience, then this is the one who is truly grateful for the blessing. He is truly grateful. The one who has the qualities that are mentioned at the end. Now this is an excerpt, uh, excerpt that is taken from a book called Aina Shakirun. Okay, Aina Shakirun. So um, if you don't, so some of you may already have this book, and those who don't have this book, try to get this book and read this book to understand shukr. What is shukr? Because it's, it's a very, very well-written book. It's an Arabic book, which is translated, and it really makes you understand the concept of shukr and how to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's called Ayn al-Shakirun, which means where are the grateful ones? Because really when we develop the quality of shukr in our lives, it will make us more positive. And when we become positive people, then life will also become beautiful. And recall, O children of Israel, when Musa said to his people, remember the favor of Allah upon you. And the purpose of remembering a blessing is to be grateful for it. 
Remember the favor of Allah upon you when he saved you from the people of Fir'aun who were, who were afflicting you with the worst torment and were slaughtering your newborn sons and keeping your females alive. And in that was a great trial from your Lord. And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. But if you deny, Indeed, my punishment is severe. When a person is grateful for blessings, Allah's bounty also increases. And what is that bounty? First of all, Allah gives him the tawfiq, the ability to do good. Then the reward also increases and the blessing itself also increases. So any blessing, whether it is health or wealth or children or family, anything, be grateful for that blessing so that the blessing is preserved and also increased. And especially women need to pay special attention to this because the hadith of the Prophet specifically mentions their ingratitude to their husband. And usually what happens is that when they get, they're not happy. And when they don't get, they waste everything. In a hadith that is mentioned, the Prophet said, if you, addressing the men, the husbands, if you are kind to one of them for a lifetime, then she sees one undesirable thing in you. She will say, I've never had anything good from you. I've never seen any good from you. I've never received any khair from you. So this sentence should never be said because this is a sentence of ingratitude. A sentence of ingratitude. So anytime shaitan puts this thought in you, immediately think. Immediately think about the blessings. What all have I got? And don't focus on just that one thing. Don't forget the good times between you. Because to have a heart that is grateful is such a huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this sentence that you never get this for me, you never do this, you never listen to me, never, 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 should be removed completely from our, from our, um, from our tongue and mouth and our, our language, basically, whatever we say, we shouldn't have the sentence in the things that we say, because this sentence constitutes as a sentence of ingratitude. And Musa salam said, if you should disbelieve, you and whoever is on the earth entirely, indeed Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. And if you're not grateful, then know that Allah does not need your gratitude. Has there not reached you the news of those before you, the people of Nuh and Ad and Samud and those after them? No one knows them but Allah. Their messengers brought them clear proofs, but they returned their hands to their mouths and said, indeed we disbelieve in that with which you have been sent, and indeed we are about that to which you invite us in this quieting doubt. Their messenger said, can there be doubt about Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth? I mean, how can there be doubt about him? He invites you that he may forgive you of your sins and he delays your death for a specified term. They said, you're not but men like us. You're just like us human beings who wish to avert us from what our forefathers were worshiping. So bring us a clear authority. Yani, the people doubted the intention of the messenger, twisted the words of the messenger. What was the messenger calling them to words and how were they interpreting it? And this what helps a person is the thought that Allah knows what I'm doing. For example, in the Quran, Allah commands patience and gratitude. Now, if someone says to you, why patience and gratitude? And why talk about this every single day? Why talk about this every single day? Now realize that this is coming from our creator, the one who created us. He repeatedly tells us to be patient and grateful. He has given us this message because if we're not patient, if we're not grateful, then we're just causing harm to ourselves. Their messenger said to them, we're only men like you, but Allah confers favor upon whom he wills of his servants by giving them prophethood. It has never been for us to bring you evidence except by permission of Allah and upon Allah let the believers rely. 
And why should we not rely upon Allah while he has guided us to our good ways? And we will surely be patient against whatever harm you should cause us. And upon Allah, let those who would rely indeed rely. And those who disbelieve said to their messengers, we will surely drive you out of our land or you must return to our religion. So their Lord inspired to them, we will surely destroy the wrongdoers and we will surely cause you to dwell in the land after them. That is for he who fears my position and fears my threats. Fearing Allah's anger, fearing his punishment is a sign of Iman. Sometimes a person is deprived of provision because of his sins. And provision isn't just tangible, but also provision could be the ability to do good. And that's why a person should fear these consequences and remain upright, keep his dealings upright. And as for the one who fears Allah, he is granted paradise. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّةً And they requested victory from Allah and disappointed therefore was every obstinate tyrant. Before him is hell and he'll be given a drink of purulent water. Astaghfirullah. He will gulp it, but will hardly be able to swallow it, but hardly be able to swallow it. And death will come to him from everywhere, but he is not to die. And before him is a massive punishment. Ibrahim Taimi says, death will come to the disbeliever from all sides of his body, even from the ends of his hair. Due to the aches of every part of his body, death will surround him. The Haq said, death comes to him from all sides, even from the toes of his feet. The example of those who disbelieve in their Lord is that their deeds are like ashes which the wind blows forcefully on a stormy day. They're unable to keep from what they earned a single thing. That is what is extreme error. Have you not seen that Allah created the heavens and the earth in truth? If he wills, he can do away with you and produce a new creation. And that is not difficult for Allah. And they will come out for judgment before Allah altogether. And the weak will say to those who were arrogant, indeed, we were your followers. So can you avail us against anything? Can you avail us anything against the punishment of Allah? They will say, if Allah had guided us, we would have guided you. It is all the same for us, whether we show intolerance or are patient. There is for us no place of escape. And that is why a person should direct himself to guidance in this world. Because on that day, nothing is going to benefit him if he did not believe here. Then after this, the sermon of shaitan is mentioned. The speech of shaitan. And this will be when the people of paradise will be taken to paradise and the people of hellfire are taken to hellfire. Then shaitan will give a speech. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانِ And shaitan will say, لَمَّا قُدِيَ الْأَمْرُ When the matter has been concluded, indeed, Allah had promised you the promise of truth, and I promised you, but I betrayed you. But I had no authority over you except that I invited you, and you responded to me. So don't blame me, but blame yourselves. I cannot be called to your aid, nor can you be called to my aid. Indeed, I deny your association of me with Allah before. Indeed, for the wrongdoers is a painful punishment. Astaghfirullah. Iblis, shaitan, when he goes to Jahannam, he will give a speech there. Now, why will he do this? Why will he give a speech in Jahannam? Because you see, what has happened has happened. Then why would he give a speech to the people of Jahannam and say all of these things? It's basically to make them feel miserable, to increase their despair, to increase their loss, to increase their distress. You know, one is that, for example, a person deceives you, but you don't know that they've deceived you, so your grief is half. And one is that a person boldly comes in front of you and tells you that he has deceived you. What will be the state of your heart then? Hmm? So Iblis would openly declare and say to them what is mentioned here. And this is our enemy. 
our enemy in this world and also an enemy there. Even there, he will completely absolve himself. And remember, every way, every path that takes a person away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way of shaitan. May Allah protect us. وَأُدْخِلَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جَنَّاتِ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ تَحِيَّتُهُمْ فِيهَا سَلَامٌ And those who believed and did righteous deeds will be admitted to gardens beneath which rivers flow, abiding eternally therein by permission of their Lord, and their greeting therein will be salam. Allah will give them salam. The angels will say salam. Morning and evening, the believers will say salam to one another. Salam upon salam. So will we not say salam to each other in the dunya? And sadly, today our children are forgetting the salam. And they say, yo, hi, hey, what's up? And that's how they greet each other, but they will not say the salam. So we should teach them our traditions. We need to teach them our ways. Teach them the beauty of saying salam. Paradise is Darus salam. And it begins with bringing Islam in this world and by spreading the salam. And you know, when you, when you seeing the salam, it's just so beautiful. And you, there's no comparison between hi, hello, and saying the salam. What does hi even mean? In, what's the meaning of the greeting? So it's a greeting, yes, hi, hello. And obviously when you're greeting non-Muslims, you will say to them hi, hello, or in whatever language. But if you're greeting a Muslim, if you're greeting a Muslim, you give them the salam. And this salam is, is, is just so amazing. In a nutshell, I'll just explain to you what the salam means. When you give the salam to someone, you're giving them your word that I am not going to harm you. As-salamu alaykum. You can only expect peace from me. You can only expect good from me. I will not betray you. I will not cheat you. I will not harm you. Because a believer is one who keeps people safe from harm and he spreads the message of peace to everyone. That when someone sees a believer, they know that they can only expect good and peace from that one. But sadly, we have left this or we have lost this quality today. Spreading the message of peace is the way of the believer. And then assalamu alaikum also means that may Salam be upon you. As-salam is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani may Allah keep you safe, secure, and protect you from the harms of this world, harms in the grave, as well as harms in the hereafter. It's a very, very comprehensive dua. Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathala. Have you not considered how Allah presents an example? Kalimatan tayyibah. Making a good word. Kashajaratin tayyibah like a good tree. And a good word here refers to kalima tawheed, la ilaha illallah. Like a good tree, asluha thabit, whose root is firmly fixed, wa far'uha fis sama, and its branches are high in the sky. And the tree that is being referred to here, shajara tayyiba, is the palm tree. And we learn of this from a narration of the Prophet wasallam that when he asked them, he asked the Sahaba, tell me about a tree that resembles the Muslim, the leaves of which do not fall in summer or winter, and it gives its fruit at all times by the leave of its Lord. It's an evergreen tree producing fruits all year round. And then the Prophet وسلم, when no one answered, he said, nakhla, it is the date palm tree. And why is the believer likened to a date palm tree? Because you see, a tree cannot be a tree without three things a deep root, a strong trunk, and high branches. Otherwise, the tree cannot stand firmly. Similarly, the believer's iman cannot be complete until his heart does not affirm, until iman doesn't take root in his heart. So iman takes root in his heart. His heart becomes firm, and then he acknowledges with his tongue, and he does good with his actions. It produces its fruits all the time by permission of its Lord. It's an evergreen tree. 
So the one whose heart is filled with Iman, then he will do beautiful deeds that will benefit others all the time. So when you meet the believer, talk to him, ask him, seek help from him, he will not disappoint you. And even if he cannot help you himself, he will get someone else to help you because he wants good for others. He wants to benefit others. He's always looking for opportunities. How can I help? How can I benefit? And then his words are good and his actions are also good. So we too should become like the evergreen tree that is always giving fruits. And if nothing else, at least give someone a smile. It's amazing that the example of a palm tree has been given, which remains green all the time, not any other tree, but this tree in particular, palm tree, because the benefits are huge. Usually what happens with us is that if our mood is good, we're good. But when we're upset, sick, distressed, frustrated, our season of fruits also comes to an end. Okay, so we can't be seasonal. We can't be seasonal, though when we feel like it, when it's in season, we do good. And when it's out of season, we don't do good. We have to be like the evergreen tree, always doing good. And Allah presents examples for the people that perhaps they will be reminded. And the example of a bad word is like a bad tree, uprooted from the surface of the earth, not having any stability. Allah keeps firm those who believe with the firm word in the worldly life. Allah grants them istiqamah, steadfastness, firmness. And in the hereafter, and Allah sends astray the wrongdoers, and Allah does what he wills. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when the deceased or one of you is buried and his companions disperse, an angel with a mace in his hand comes to him and makes him sit. He says, what do you say about this man if he was a believer? What do you say about this man? If he was a believer, he will say, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his servant and his messenger. So the angel says, you have spoken the truth. Then a door to the fire is opened up for him. And the angel says, this would have been your destination had you denied your Lord. But since you believed, therefore this is your home. And then a door to Jannah is open. He tries to enter it, but the angel says to him, stay here. And his grave is, and his grave is expanded for him. So when the people heard this, they said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, any person before whom this angel would come bearing a mace in his hand would be overcome by fear. I mean, what would give him that confidence to give the response to the question? So at that, the Prophet ﷺ recited this ayah, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ Allah keeps firm those who believe with the firm word. And the firm word is la ilaha illallah. Those who believed in it, lived it, applied it, Allah will give them istiqama in the grave as well. But as for the wrongdoer, they'll be deprived of the firm word. And Allah sends astray the wrongdoers. And Allah does what he wills. Have you not considered those who exchange the favor of Allah for disbelief? and settle their people in the home of ruin, it is hell, which they will enter to burn, and wretched is the settlement. And they have attributed to Allah equals to mislead people from his way. Say, enjoy yourselves, for indeed your destination is the fire. O Prophet, tell my servants who have believed to establish prayer and spend from what we have provided them secretly and publicly. Publicly, why? to encourage others before a day comes in which there'll be no exchange nor any friendships. Now notice how every day sadaqa is being mentioned. You know, sometimes a person thinks, but what if I don't find someone every day to give sadaqa to? Like, you know, nowadays we're at home. So what should I do then? In this case, every day you can put a little amount in a coin box or a sadaqa box at home. And later on, when you have the opportunity, you can give it to someone. You see, Aisha radiallahu anha and Asma radiallahu anha both had different ways of doing sadaqah. One of them would give as and when she had something to give. So when something would come in, she would immediately give it away in, in charity. And the other one would collect and then give. So both ways are okay. 
It is Allah who created the heavens and the earth and sent down rain from the sky and produced thereby some fruits as provision for you and subjected for you the ships to sail through the sea by his command and subjected for you the rivers. And he subjected for you the sun and the moon continuous in orbit and subjected for you the night and the day. And he gave you from all that you asked of him. And if you should count the favor of Allah, وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا You could not enumerate them because there's so many. Indeed, mankind is generally most unjust and ungrateful. And mention a prophet when Ibrahim said, My Lord, make this city secure and keep me and my sons away from worshipping idols. My Lord, indeed, they have led astray many among the people. So whoever follows me, then he is of me. And whoever disobeys me, Indeed, you are yet forgiving and merciful. So what was the character of the prophets of Allah? That they would not make dua against their people. Like from the tribe of um, Daus, from the tribe of Daus, uh, Tufail bin Amr al-Dawsi came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said to him, the tribe, so, so he accepted Islam, went back to his people, invited them. They were very slow in responding. So he came back to the Messenger of Allah and he said, the tribe of those has disobeyed Allah and his messenger and refused to embrace Islam. So make dua against them. So here you have a man, Tufail, who's asking the Prophet Sallallahu to make dua against a people. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, Allahumma hdi dawsa wa bihim. Oh Allah, guide the tribe of those and let them come to us. He didn't make dua against them, he made dua for them. Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house, our Lord, so that they may establish prayer. So make hearts among the people inclined toward them and provide for them from the fruits that they might be grateful. We need to ask ourselves, where do we want to settle our children? And usually where they can lead better lives. But here we see Ibrahim Islam settled his child at a place where there was nothing. Why? So that they could establish prayer. And then he also makes dua to Allah to incline the hearts of people towards them. So make dua for both the deen and the dunya. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. Our Lord, indeed you know what we conceal and what we declare, and nothing is hidden, and nothing is hidden from Allah on the earth or in the heaven. Praise to Allah who has granted to me in old age Ismail and Ishaq. Indeed, my Lord is the hearer of supplication. My Lord, make me an establisher of prayer. Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Make me an establisher of prayer and many from my descendants, our Lord, and accept my supplication. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْحِسَّابِ Our Lord forgive me and my parents and the believers the day the account is established. And everything that Allah is unaware of what the wrongdoers do, He only delays them for a day when eyes will stare in horror. Racing ahead, their heads raised up, their glance does not come back to them and their hearts are void. And O Prophet, warn the people of a day when the punishment will come to them. And those who did wrong will say, Our Lord, delay us for a short term. We will answer your call and follow the messengers. But they will be said to them, Had you not sworn before that for you there would be no cessation? You thought that the punishment would never come because of your arrogance? You thought that you would live in this world forever? And you lived among the dwellings of those who wronged themselves and it had become clear to you how we dealt with them. And we presented for you many examples. But what happened? They didn't take a lesson. And they had planned their plan. But with Allah is recorded their plan, even if their plan had been sufficient to do away with the mountains. So never think that Allah will fail in his promise to his messengers. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and owner of retribution. It will be on the day the earth will be replaced by another earth. And this is on the day of judgment. And the heavens as well. 
and all creatures will come out before Allah, the one, the prevailing. And you will see the criminals that day bound together in shackles, their garments of liquid pitch and their faces covered by the fire. Astaghfirullah. So that Allah will recompense every soul for what it earned. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. This is a notification for the people. What is a notification for the people? This Quran is a balag. So they may be warned thereby, so that they're warned through the Quran. And that they may know that He is but one God, which is the essence of the Qur'an, the main message of the Qur'an, that there's only one deity worthy of worship. And that those of understanding will be reminded. This is the purpose of the Qur'an, that people are warned, and so that they know that there's only one God. And who will understand? Only the people of understanding, the people of intellect, the people of reasoning. And this is why it is so important that we read the Qur'an ourselves and we also instill the love of the Qur'an in the hearts of our children, in the hearts of our families. Surah Al-Hijr, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the ever merciful. Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayat Al-Kitab Wa Qur'an Mubeen. Alif Lam Ra, these are the verses of the book and a clear Quran. Wa Quran al Mubeen. May Allah give us the ability to act upon this book and love this book and share this with others. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. أشهد ولا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. Let's look at the action points and then inshallah we will conclude. Okay, so the first point here, make a list of the qualities of Yusuf alayhi salam. So go through Surah Yusuf again, inshallah when you're reciting these juz again in your personal recitation, note down the qualities of Yusuf alayhi salam so that you can adopt those qualities yourself. Point number two, recite this dua before going to bed. Okay, and we mentioned this du'a earlier. And point number three, learn, memorize, recite, and share these beautiful du'as for a good end. Okay, and we mentioned three du'as in particular, and they're mentioned here in front of you. So learn these du'as, recite them yourself, and also share these du'as with others so that they may also recite them. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, we'll see you all tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.